Hey everyone, I think, um, I think we'll make a start. Good evening everyone. And welcome back to Council Head Society. We trust you all had a happy and relaxing midwinter break. And then we're all looking forward to the 2020. Tonight we have a great pleasure in welcoming James Chris to speak with us. James is going to talk about the Battle of Carnum, which took place in the year 1080. James studied medieval history at the University of St Andrews. He is current chairman of the Berwick History Society and writes for local newspapers on history-related topics. James is also writing his first book about pilgrimage to Jerusalem. It is almost, but not quite, up and ready, as he puts it. The part of James' reason for moving to Berwick on Tweed in 2013 was, to, was its proximity to both Holy Island and to Scotland. James says that way he gets to see the best of both worlds. <laughs> well, we wouldn't argue with you there, James, so we look forward to your talk very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Is that uh, everything working? Okay, fine. Great. Uh, thank you for the invitation, and um, it's great to be here. A tweed jacket like this one is an essential part of the uniform for someone giving a talk about car, because of course it was this battle which established the River Tweed as an international frontier. Dr. Alex Wolfe uh, from the University of St Andrews uh, appeared in a BBC clip in 2014 and he said this, without the unification of Scotland, there would be no Scottish history. And perhaps the key moment is the Battle of Cara. Malcolm II had led an army into Northumbria and defeated the English Earl Uxbred. The battle which secured Scottish rule of the land south of the Forth and made sure that what we now think of as the core territory of Scotland, Glasgow, Edinburgh in the Central Belt, became Scottish. Without Carham, there would be no Scotland. However, the new Penguin History of Scotland, published in 2001, has not a single mention of Cara. <laughs> Alex Wolfe's St Andrew's colleague, Dr Barbara Crawford, who was actually my teacher for a time, co-wrote the relevant chapter and mentioned the acquisition of Lothian, but not the battle. So what is going on? Here we have, you all I'm sure probably recognise this, uh, a map of Roxburghshire and a detail <coughs> here so we can see there's Carham and Coldstream. I gave this talk there and that was um, a great thing to do because it's sometimes called the Battle of Coldstream, this battle. And um, so uh, I'm, I'm equally glad though to, to be here in Roxburghshire and you may gather that uh, I'm interested in looking at different possibilities for the battlefield location, so we'll come on to that again. This is the um, the Carham panel from the Great Tapestry of Scotland. Acknowledgements to photographer Vivian Martin and artist Andrew Crummy. Also to Alistair Moffat who wrote the text. And the names of the stitches can be found on the Great Tapestry of Scotland website. I mentioned that because we met a, one, one of the stitches of a different panel recently. Um, it says hook tread, in fact, uh, oof tread, there are different spellings for him, but um, <coughs> oof tread versus Malcolm II. What we have here is an outline of the weaponry, swords, battle axes, spears, bows and arrows, and clubs. Cavalry did not feature prominently. Armies formed themselves into shield walls. Uh, the top left, oh, sorry. The top left you can see here, this is, um, the Fox and the Grapes is uh, one of Aesop's fables. Somebody had to tell me that, I'm afraid I didn't know. But anyway, you probably knew that. Here, uh, also, there's the, um, the River Tweed. This is a spinning wheel, and uh, I'm not quite sure what those are. Uh, but anyway, um, it could be grey toast, perhaps. Um, but um, writing about this panel in the Scotsman in February 2017, Alan Sutherland admitted. I'd never heard of the Battle of Cara before, but historians say it marks the official start of Scotland as a country. 
and uh, stylistically perhaps this image is vaguely reminiscent of Art Nouveau. Um, just mention that because uh, this is the Abilemno stone and it's possibly got a little bit of an Art Nouveau flourish here as well, but anyway. Um, the the uh, text here, Abilemno stone in Angus, long considered a portrayal of the Pictish victory at Dunnechting, Nextensmere in uh, 685. The mere part of Nextensmere refers to a lake or a loch. Uh, see also Windermere, Buttermere, etc. This word will, come, will reappear later. So, And then what we have here, the Battle of Dunnechting. There are two candidates, two possible locations for the, for the battle. Dunnechen is the, is the the best known one, but the trouble is, uh, because an early an early version of the name Dunnekin was found to be Dunnechtin, which is exactly how it's recorded in the early sources, but thanks to the work of Dr. Wolf, it lost its unique selling point, because there's a place up here, Dunnechtin, Dunnechtin Estate in uh, Badenoch and uh, Strathspey, where, which has exactly the same original name, Dunnechtin, and in, in, in a number of ways, this is a better candidate. So if Wolf is right, the mere in next to mere was Loch Inch, and uh, up here. So then this is a, this is the village of Moira, which is near Lisburn in County Down. The Battle of Moira was an outstandingly grisly battle which took place in 637. It is said that during construction of the railway here in the early 19th century, a very considerable number of skeletons were unearthed. And I've just included this because there's often dispute, in fact there's usually dispute, over the location of early medieval battles. But it's not impossible to pin them down with some degree of certainty. So, right, let's get back to Carl. Saxon, England, uh, AD 900. Obviously, this covers more than just England. Scots indicated on the western margin, actually here, with one foot, still with one foot, as it were, in Ulster. Scots here. Um, and note also Wessex, all of this area here. This is the heartland of the English kings. And a detail, Northern Britain, Northumbria, was divided between Bernicia and Dera. Dera in the south with the capital of York. Bernicia's capital is Bamburgh. Then um, the Scottish and Pictish realms were uniting into the kingdom of Alba, which became Scotland. Strathclyde, Cumbria, this, here, this area here, the words Strathclyde and Cumbria are more or less interchangeable uh, for our purposes anyway was ruled by a sub-regulus of the kings of Alba, that's um, a, a subordinate king of the kings of Alba, obliged to provide military assistance. Around the middle of the 10th century, the Scots are understood to have taken possession of Edinburgh, a vital bridgehead south of the fort. From there, they made incursions and apparently occupied Lothian. So this, of course, is our place we were looking at. Edgar's Field, uh, right here we go, Edgar's Field, that's where this is now, Edgar's Field in the Hanbridge area of Chester with the River Dee in the background. A Victorian artist's impression of Edgar's Conference of 973 showing the English King at the helm. And it says here, Edward the Pacific, Edward the Peaceable, being rowed down the River Dee by eight tributary princes. <coughs> the subordinate kings, uh, a subordinate ruler, Sub Regulus, included Kenneth II of Alba, Malcolm II's father, and Malcolm of Strathclyde. These subordinate kings are traditionally believed to have promised aid on land and sea and that they would attend state occasions when the English king wore his crown, thought to be annual occurrences. 
Modern historians tend to be critical of 12th century historians for seeing this in terms of Kenneth holding Lothian as a thief within England. In the same way Anglo-Norman kings, for instance, held lands in France, Normandy, Aquitaine, etc. But I'd suggest the 12th century historians may be on something. In both cases, the lands held by a neighboring king within another king's realm proved to be a cause of conflict in France, the Hundred Years' War. There's an outstanding essay on this summit meeting that took place in 1973. Uh, it's called, Why Were Some 10th Century Kings Presented as Rulers of Britain? by George Molyneux. Edgar, the King of the English, had sent an embassy to Holy Roman Emperor Otto I earlier in 973. And he clearly modelled Chester on a conference of kings at Quedlinburg, which took place at Easter, at which Otto entertained dukes of Poland and Bohemia with Danish, Greek, Hungarian, Bulgar, Slavic and Italian rulers. The formula for Edgar's reconsecration at Bath Abbey at Pentecost in that year included a prayer that he be honoured above all kings of Britain, whereas at his previous consecration, the wording is likely to have been above all kings of the land. Interestingly, although generally very complimentary about Edgar, William of Malmesbury, he's a very important um, 12th century uh, source uh, and historian, he complains that Edgar had continental tastes and welcomed numerous immigrants, Saxons, Flemings, and even Danes. Looking at this through the prism of today's politics, one might tentatively infer that Edgar could have been a Remainer. <laughs> so, then looking at this um, next slide, I'm indebted here to Alex Wolfe's groundbreaking work from Pictland to Alba, 789 to 1070, uh, Anglo-Scottish relations around the year 1000. Uchtred was Earl of Bamburgh, oops, I keep getting that wrong, but here we go, Earl of Bamburgh, and, um, where are we? This was his seat of government, and it continued to be when he later became Earl of Bernicia, so there's his Bamburgh, this is his seat, and, and his family's seat as well, Bamburgh. The conventional, uh, rather, Malcolm, Malcolm II's heartland was around the Tay estuary. Important, strong, important royal strongholds included St. Andrews, Schoon, and Dunkeld. So this is the area where uh, Malcolm II has his heartland. And then a detail, it shows uh, Stowe. Interestingly, Stowe is included, I'm not quite sure why, but um, <coughs> Caddenley. A muster point for Scottish armies in later centuries. Dr. Wolfe thinks it may have served this purpose prior to our battle, Academy. But I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. But the, the conventional view is that Malcolm and his ally, and his ally Owen of Strathclyde, were the aggressors. True to his reputation, then. Uchtred the Bold, as he was known, and his men are thought to have sallied forth to meet them from Bamburgh, somewhere in the, in the, around about Carum. And um, though he would have been safe enough in his stronghold at Bamburgh, he could have stayed in Bamburgh. <coughs> this will need to be looked at again, though, after I hope we've established some more background. So now this is a quote from. Um, a book by Ranach Daly, The Birth of the Border, at Battle of Karam 1018. We know from English sources that in 995 AD, Kenneth II, King of the Scots, invaded Northumbria. The church community of St. Cuthbert fled from Chester the Street to Ripon and then to Durham. Kenneth was beaten off by Uchtred, son of the Earl of Bamburgh. In 10 a 1005 AD, King Kenneth III was killed at Monaiverd by Malcolm II, who succeeded him. Malcolm decided that he too would invade Northumbria. 
After being bested by Uchtred at Durham in 1006, he limped back to Scotland to lick his wounds. King Ethelred rewarded Uchtred by making him Earl of York as well as Bamborough, reuniting Northumbria <coughs> under one ruler. Malcolm's raid is what was known as a Crech Reek, meaning royal prey or hunt, a foray into enemy territory by a new <coughs> king intent on establishing his tough guy credentials. Malcolm would also have been enticed by the treasures of St. Cuthbert, whose relics had arrived in Durham in AD 995. However, Uchtred the Bold's Northumbrian army inflicted a heavy defeat. The heads of Scottish nobles were mounted on spikes and displayed on the walls of Durham. And we can see here, oops, uh, from a 12th century account that Uchtred had the heads of the slain made more presentable with their hair combed, as was then the custom, and taken to Durham, there washed by four women and fixed on stakes around the walls. They gave the women who had washed them a cow each as payment. <laughs> so in an era known for its blood feuds, I mean this really, this is one of the first things that comes out about this part of the world and this era. Uh, henceforward, Malcolm and Uchtred are mortal foes. <coughs> Carum, uh, according to the 12th century sources that we have, these are very important. But they're very brief, they're very short, but they, they're very important sources for the battle. Uh, the first one attributed to Simeon of Durham, so he's writing in the early 12th century. A great battle was fought at Carum between the Scots and the English, between Uchtred, son of Waltheof, Earl of Northumbria, and Malcolm II, King of the Scots. With him was Owen the Bald, King of the Men of Strathclyde, and from a different work of Simeon's. In the year of the Lord's Incarnation, 1018, while Canute controlled the Kingdom of the English, a comet appeared for thirty nights to the people of Northumbria, and with dread presage, foreshowed the province's future disaster. For shortly after, that is, after thirty days, while they fought at Carum against an endless host of Scots, the entire people from the River Tees to the Tweed, with their nobility, almost wholly perished. Uh, then we have Bishop, the Bishop Eldhun, hearing of the lamentable slaughter of St Cuthbert's people, was smitten to the heart with deep grief. After a few days caught by disease, he died after passing 29 years in the Episcopate. And we learn from another source that he quotes, 18 priests inadvisedly mixed themselves up in the war, which no doubt would have contributed to Bishop Aldhern's grief. Now, this is an important part of the story of Carum, the comet. <clears throat> the Annals of Ulster, S.A. Subanno, in the year of 1018, record, a comet appeared this year for the space of a fortnight in the autumn season. And then this chap, Dietmar of Merseburg on the continent, in the month of August 1018, a new star appeared next to the plough and terrified all who saw it with its distant rays. The shining star was visible for more than 14 days. And this comet was also recorded by Chinese, Japanese and Korean uh, chroniclers, so um, it's very well documented, this comet. The dating controversy, however, which has um, been a familiar thing with Karen for a long time, it's because of this, it's because of this entry in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle under the year 1016. Uchtred from necessity submitted to Canute's army and all the Northumbrians with him. He gave hostages, and notwithstanding, they slew him and Thersitel, son of Nafena, with him. And then, after that, King Canute appointed Eric as his earl in Northumbria, as Uchtred had been. In 1976, Professor A. A. M. Duncan argued that the underlined words above are parenthetic, they're in parentheses. They were a comment by the author of the 1016 Annal, writing between 1018 and 1019, 
You knew of the recent death of Ultra, and you wished to stress bitterly the faithlessness of Canute. In other words, though remarked upon under 1060, it, that is, Ultra's death occurred in 1080. Now this is a bit complicated, but, but the point is, we think of this battle as being between Uchtred and Malcolm. <coughs> but if Uchtred is already dead in 1018, then you either have to move the battle, or you have to say that Uchtred wasn't there. And Duncan, a Professor Duncan has found this solution, that the, the, the um, the, the relevant quote in the, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is uh, a little bit misleading. It's talking about things that happened after 1016, because that was the perspective of the writer. It's a little bit complicated, but in my view, this is the solution. There are still some historians who aren't satisfied with this. Um, and there are, still, there are still some people who think that the uh, Ostrad was in fact dead in, in 1016. But I don't think that's necessary. I think, and, and a lot, I think there's probably um, a, almost a consensus among historians that this should at least be taken very seriously, and most historians uh, regard it as something that they accept. So um, it's thought that what was left of the earldom of Bernicia passed to Uchtred's brother Edolf Edolf Kudel. Cuttlefish, a reference to his alleged, alleged cowardice. Recognising the facts on the ground, Cuddell, Cuttlefish, acknowledged Malcolm's claim to Lothian, but is said to have laid down the condition that his language and customs were not to be interfered with. And so that's why, right through the Middle Ages, you have these, um, this approach to Lothian, that David, King of Scots, sends greetings to all his liegemen of Lothian, Clarks and laymen, French and English. So this is a place where the, not only actually the English, but also the French. <coughs> and and this um, from George Molyneux, writing in 2011. Adam of Dryborough, writing in what is now the Scottish borders in 1179 to 80, regarded himself as living in the land of the English, Terra Anglorum, and in the kingdom of the Scots, Regno Scotorum. That is the legacy of uh, Malcolm's capture of Lothian, that it's an English part of Scotland. So then, this quote, uh, TV historian Michael Wood is very fond of this famous quote. On the threshold of the millennium, it was as though the very world had shaken herself and cast off her old age and were clothing herself everywhere in a white garment of churches. In Britain, however, the early 11th century is violent and politically tumultuous. And this is a major part of the reason why. Constant harrying by Danes, Norsemen, Vikings, Viking campaigns. And you can see therefore that uh, they are Harrying all around the, the seaboard of the of, of Britain, and especially they're focusing uh, the uh, south coast, but they are they're also uh, coming up to um, as far as Northumberland, according to this map. And incidentally, Leif Erikson had only recently sailed to Newfoundland in the year 1000, with Scots, Hake, and Hecia among his crew. Columbus, of course, was not the first European to navigate across the Atlantic. Uh, that was uh, something that happened in the year 1000, and it's uh, all recognised by the United Nations, etc. So, uh, and, and there, were Scot there were Scots in his crew. So uh, then, the next one, John of Forda. This is what I'd like to look at first, before we come on to Hector Boyce in the top corner. John of Fordun and the, the Chronicle of the Scottish Nation, Scottish Nation, which he wrote in about 1360. Othred, that is Othred, different spellings again. Othred, likewise an English earl, so we're just here, but subject to the Danes, endeavoured to plunder Cumbria, though I know not what was the cause of the hostilities which broke out between them. 
but Malcolm recovered the plunder and overcame him in a hard-fought battle near Bergen or Bergi or Burra, something like that. And that's this word here in the Latin. Dr. Neil McGuigan provided this Latin quotation in the recent Battle of Carum book he co-edited, though this translation isn't his. According to Professor David Broom, John of, John of Fordan's 11th century material was based on a chronicle by Richard Vermont, aka uh, also known as Veramundus, at St Andrews in the 13th century. Fordan was spurred into action by the knowledge that Scotland's national archives had been ransacked by Edward III of England. He scoured libraries across Britain and Ireland, hunting down surviving documents. Taking their cue from the Victorians, modern historians have tended to be rather sniffy about Fordham and other historians of the Scoto-Latin chronicle tradition, like Walter Bauer and this fellow Hector Boyce. Hector Boyce was a professor of philosophy in Paris and a friend of Erasmus. In 1500 he became the first principal of Aberdeen University, establishing the post of Regis Professor of Moral Philosophy, which continues to this day. Interesting in view of Scotland's outstanding contribution to the study of philosophy. Boyce's work is perhaps best known as the origin of Shakespeare's rather skewed portrayal of Macbeth as an arch villain. And it's always important to be circumspect when you're reading these uh, chronicles written by uh, the Scots or the English or anyone from that time. However, another thing that comes up in the chronicles that, that are written by Scots are accounts of large-scale fighting like the Battle of Barry against the Danes in 1010. And these are also dismissed as fanciful often. But looking again at this map, I'm not sure why that should be. So we can see that the, the, the Danes and, Nor and, the, and the Norwegians were harrying the coast uh, all the way along here, so why why is it such a, so surprising that they should also attack Scotland? And people are, people tend to be um, skeptical of the the Scottish writers because they said that the Scots Malcolm II achieved a certain number of victories over the Danes, and it and it seems as if they are making up uh, making up patriotic stories. But actually, it seems reasonable to suppose that there would be fighting going on further north. And uh, so I would argue that the prominence of Cumber in this description, where it says that uh, he, that um, Oxtred went to plunder Cumbria, it means it could actually be one of the more important sources. Where though, it, the, begs, uh, the, the question needs to be asked, where is Bergen or Borough <coughs> referring to? Now this is um, another detail from the map that you saw earlier. Karum up here, and uh, what you also have is Roxburgh. Now, uh, from Roxburgh's entry in the Regent's <coughs> Gazetteer of Scotland, 1901, a royal borough is talking about uh, David the first and actually the monks of Kelso you can see there referring to uh, referred to but it says a royal borough one of those four boroughs the others being Edinburgh Berwick and Stirling <coughs> whose Burgle Parliament still exists and then it says at the bottom uh, that old Roxburgh was governed by a provost and baileys it had a lot it had a borough or city seal and it was the seat of a royal mint down here at least in the reigns of William the Lion and James II. Of course, you're an audience that knows very well that Roxburgh was a very important place. But I'm just making this only as a suggestion, but um, on this, this kind of thing as well, Roxburgh's entry in the new statistical account of Scotland from 1834, uh, it's, this is talking about Roxburgh Castle and the condition it's in. And it says that the mighty change the castle has undergone, while it reminds of former times, conveys a lesson of the instability of worldly greatness. The point I'm making is that, although it's only a suggestion, it seems plausible that Borough could
could be a reference to Roxburgh. Roxburgh was such an important place that it might have been referred to simply as Borough in a 13th century account. Obviously, there's no convincing proof of that, but it's just an idea. Now, looking at this uh, map detail again, Alex Wolf's idea about Haddenley. <coughs> Regardless of whether he's right about that, I think we should be focused on this area south of the Tweed, but not necessarily near to the river bank itself. This is the area, obviously. And, uh, and I think that the armies met each other and they were probably based south of the Tweed uh, for some time before they met, perhaps. Anyway, you'll see why I've mentioned that. But this, this then is um, St. Bede on the Battle of Tours from his ecclesiastical history. In the year of our Lord's incarnation, 729, two comets appeared about the sun to the great terror of the beholders. They carried their flaming tail towards the earth, as it were ready to set the world on fire. They appeared in January and continued nearly a fortnight, at which time a dreadful plague of Saracens ravaged France with miserable, miserable slaughter. But they, not long after in that country, received the punishment due to their wickedness. This is the Battle of Tours. So, crossing over from Morocco, uh, the Moors overran the Iberian Peninsula very quickly. Abdul Rahman al Gafiki's quarry was the fabled wealth of the shrine of St. Martin at Tours, up here somewhere. Not unlike Malcolm's targeting of Durham and the treasures of St. Cuthbert. However, he was heavily defeated by troops under the command of Charles Martel, that's this person here, and from that time onwards, the Moors largely stayed south of the Pyrenees. For English speakers, it's usually called the Battle of Tours because the name the French give it, the Battle of Poitiers, is taken up by a clash in the Hundred Years' War. Meanwhile, though, 12 miles north of Poitiers and 50 miles south of Tours, there's a village called Moussaï la Bataille, which historians have seized upon as the best available candidate for the battlefield location. Bataille is the French word from which we get English battle. So it's in the name of the village and they think this, this, this is a good candidate for the place where the actual battle happened. And then there's a, this example, Hastings. As I'm sure most of you know, the Battle of Hastings, obviously there were people alive uh, at the Battle of Hastings who, who would have remembered the aftermath, certainly, of the Battle of Carum. And the Battle of Hastings was actually fought at a place called Battle, East Sussex, seven miles north of Hastings itself. And this is a detail of Halley's Comet. So it means there are two very important battles, arguably two of the most consequential battles ever fought, both preceded by comets, and both known by names that are not the actual battlefield locations. Moreover, in both cases, the actual locations appear to be identified by the word battle in a local place name. So I'm pointing out two of them, Tour, Poitiers, Battle Tours, and Hastings. And at the risk of inviting a certain amount of mirth, I'd like to submit the possibility that there may be a third now this is the Battle of Assenden, which was 1016. On the left is All Saints Ashton, and on the right is St Andrews in Ashenden. The site of this battle is disputed, and each of these villages, one in the northern and the other in the southern part of Essex, have their cheerleaders. It happens that my granddad lived in Ashton, so I'm aware of the temptation to go with the more satisfying candidate. Uh, but, um, if we look here, coming back to Karen, a 1920s map, with the modern border, Karen Burn, uh, between Scotland and England. So where are we? Uh, here is the Karen Burn. In the 7th century, Karen was reported to have been donated to St. Cuthbert, i.e. to the monks of Lindisfarne, by King Egfrith of Northumbria, in thanksgiving for a victory over the, over the Mercians. Therefore, it's likely to have been among the better-known settlements in the area. 
like Hastings or Torres from that point of view. Here we see 1018 actually written over there, somewhere near Cold Street, uh, quite near Cold Street. And there's this 833 clash with the cross swords there uh, between Saxons and Danes at Carum, recorded by 16th century antiquary John Leland. There is a Carhampton in Somerset, which might actually have a better claim to this battle, that one. Uh, though I'm not pretending to be able to offer any useful insight into that. In any case, over the years, human bones have apparently been found in this vicinity, in the parish of Carham, and uh, perhaps belonging to people killed in 833 or in 1018. However, one of my biggest reservations about locating our battle in or near Karam itself is a phrase often used to describe a military victory. We say that one side or the other is left in possession of the battlefield. If Karam was a significant Scottish fleet of arms, why would they retreat from the place where they achieved it? Now, uh, this is another Ordnance Gazetteer detail. Karam is up here and Roxburgh is here and then I'm interested in this area a bit further south around there. Now this is a very precious book which I came across, the place names of Roxburgh, Rox, place names of Roxburghshire. I apologise that this slide is a bit overcrowded but there are some points I'd like to make about Yetham. So at the top Yetum, the settlement at the gate, Old English, Get Ham, Yet Ham, 1165-1214 in the Mel Melrose Charter Book, and thus until the 16th century when it appears as Yet Home. Yet Home is situated at the end of a narrow pass through the hills, and then from this early 19th century account, uh, from the, somebody from the Presbytery of Kelso, and you can see that it says, Yetham is a border parish and the villages of Town and Kirk Yetham are separated from England by a valley one mile in length and about a quarter of a mile in breadth, which in former times must have presented a very easy access or entrance from the one country to the other. So that Yetham or Yetham may signify the hamlet or dwelling upon the great entrance from England or the adjoining parts of Northumberland into Scotland and we could, we could replace Scotland there with Strathclyde Cumbria, perhaps, in our time that we're talking about. Um, now, uh, hold on, uh, well, I just need to check. Um, right, Linton's place name. So, uh, again from the place names of uh, Roxburghshire, Linton. The farm by the lake, Welsh, Lynn, Old English Tun, a great part of Linton Parish was formerly underwater. Uh, see the link, which is now a drain. And then the other great find which I made when I was preparing this talk is this wonderful uh, booklet, The Parish of Linton, for, by uh, A.O. Mackey and M.J.H. Robson, The Parish of Linton. Linton's position on the border left it open to plunder and destruction when peace between England and Scotland was a rarer thing. And this is again from an early 19th century account. <coughs> Occupying part of what was formerly called the Dry Marches, obviously that's distinguishing uh, that part of the march from the Tweed, which is the Wet Marches, presumably. This is the, so occupying part of what was formerly called the Dry Marches, it formed one of the principal thoroughfares betwixt the two kingdoms. A narrow aperture between two hills along the verge of Linton Loch appears to have been regarded as an important pass, and there are still obvious marks of its having once having been once closely guarded. Now, uh, there were the other thing that they have that there is in. Um, in this uh, parish of Linton booklet, there were once five or six stones in a circle about the size of a cockpit 
and collectively known as the Trist, because they were a rendezvous where predatory hordes projecting an incursion into Northumberland were once meet. So Linton is a place that uh, has form, as it were. It's, got, it, it's a place where there definitely was uh, trouble either um, conceived in Linton or it actually happened in Linton, around that area. And this is a photo from April 2018, uh, an important pass between two hills. On St Cuthbert's Way, this is where I, where I took this photo from, looking west from Crooked Shores Hill towards the site of Linton Lock, with High Side on the right, those are the two hills. Now then, so this is what I'm driving at. The map detail, uh, map detail shows Yetham here and Linton, uh, Linton here and Linton Kirk and more battle. So uh, you please hear me out, okay? <laughs> you're going you're, you're to think that going to be ridiculous, but anyway. Uh, the next one, uh, the next one here. So Linton, this is a sketch map in that in the booklet. Linton, more battle, and th this is where Linton Lock was. Ah, I keep losing my place here. Sorry about this. Um, now, the, there is a problem with the name. Uh, we have to overcome the problem. First, uh, the, this is the again the um, the pass between the two hills the two hills here, and there's more battle, and there's Linton. So I realise that what I'm suggesting flies in the face of centuries of accumulated wisdom. But anyway, here on the, this is a modern uh, the account of, on the Undiscovered Scotland website. It is tempting to think that the name of more battle dates back to these turbulent times of cross-border conflict. In fact, it seems to have much earlier origins, from the Anglo-Saxon near Bogle, meaning the house by the lake. The lake in question lay in the river valley to the north of today's Moor Battle and was drained in the 1800s. And then returning to the place names of Roxburghshire, Moor Battle, the building by the lake, Old English near bottle, near Boda is how it appears in its very first uh, recording, near Boda, in 1116, in the Glasgow Cathedral, Char Glasgow Cathedral Charter Book. And then this is the evolution. Mere Bothell, 1165 to 1214 in Melrose. And between Moor Battle and Linton, there was an extensive lake which was drained in the 19th century. Then this is uh, a, a book called <coughs> The Place Names of Scotland by W.J. Robertson. Moor Battle. In, in its earliest formation of form, earliest version, mere Boda, then mere bottle, more bottle, mar bottle, Old English, mere bottle, lake house or dwelling, and compare that to new battle, a similar corruption, and har bottle near Rothbury. The Boda in 1116 is an early form of booth, earlier than any in Dr. Murray's dictionary, and uh, compare it to Old Icelandic bift and Danish and Swedish bod, a booth, dwelling. And then it says New Battle. So just as a comparison, New Battle and Dalkeith was New Bothla, New Bottle, New Bottle, Now Battle, New Bottle. Old English, New Bottle, New Dwelling. And it says to compare it to More Battle and New Bottle Durham. There's also Law Bottle, Shore Bottle, War Bottle. These are examples of the same element. But there are very few place names of Danish or Scandinavian origin in Roxburghshire or Northumberland. This Boda element not only makes more battle highly unusual, it's unique among all these places in Botter. So is there something rotten in the state of Denmark? This is a, the old English translator which I found. Uh, the word Boda, we still have, in, we still use this in English when we say that something, that, so it's uh, a messenger, an envoy, a herald, an apostle, an angel, or a prophet, and we say that something does or does not bode well, so that still, still survives. 
And then the, the old English word for a battle is this word bidu or biadu, I don't know how you pronounce the course. Um, now, in making this argument that the battlefield is hiding in plain sight, the problem of the name is not easily overcome, and there's no slam dunk solution, as the Americans say. So I can only try to make the best case I can. But uh, what I did also come across was this book, uh, The Place Names of Sussex. These are three different excerpts, though they all happen to appear on the same page. So probably it says here, talking about Beardu, this is the word that means battle in, in Old English. A place, uh, Beardu Herd, Beardu Helm, etc., which were, were common in Old English. And then you can see examples here. These are places that had links to a battle. And then the type two, it says Bodingers here. Type two, I cannot explain. If the old English form were uh, Beardingas, it might be accounted for by a shifting of stress. But it seems that the quantity of the EA in, in old English, Beardingas, was short. It may, of course, be a mere scribal error. So, Obviously, this is quite technical um, uh, etymology, but the point is, if you've got something that, that is like a BOD, it could have come from, from being a BEAD. It's not, it's not completely outrageous to suggest that it had. And um, then, so this is what I'm suggesting happened. Oops. Um, the development of the name War Battle with a hypothetical scribal error by a cleric at Glasgow Cathedral. Mere Beardu or Bidu or similar, and then a squeamish and or inattentive clerk wrote Mere Boda in 1116, which became Mere Bottle and Mere More Bottle and More Battle. The documented evolution of New Battle indicates that Bottle and Battle could have been interchangeable during this process. So uh, New Battle started off as New Bottler then became New Bottle, New Bottle, then New Battle, and then New Bottle again, and then now it's New Battle again. So, and that was a new dwelling. Now, uh, the next slide is Somerville Stone. This is the tympanum of Minton Parish Church. You'll be reassured to know that I'm not about to turn this into a quest for the Minton Worm and how it may be related to the abominable snowman or, any, or anything else. But it's important to highlight the French influence because if you're saying that more battle is possibly named after a battle, the word battle is, is French rather than English. Somerville was the family that, that owned, um, they were the lords of the manor of, of uh, Linton in the 12th century. And of course they were a French family. Somerville comes from Saint-Omer in, uh, in Normandy. So uh, that is how there is a possible French influence, which could again uh, affect this evolution of the name of more battle. Now we are coming to the end, I promise. Um, so uh, the, the Battle of Karim detail again this one. What happened? Based on John of Fordun's account, which uh, we can see again here. I'll just have, just have a look at this again. Oaks tread, likewise an, er, an English earl, the subject of the Danes, endeavoured to plunder Cumbria, though I know not what was the cause of the hostilities which broke out between them. But Malcolm <coughs> recovered the plunder and overcame him in a hard fought battle near Bergen, which may be Roxborough. So, what happened? I'm currently inclined to believe that the Northumbrians, not the Scots, were the aggressors. Uchtred had submitted to Canute, but he had been stripped of his lands in Dera, York, and his position was no doubt precarious. Either under orders from Canute or on his own permit, or, or on his own initiative, perhaps he decided the best way to shore up his position would be to inflict a military defeat on the enemy he had in common with Canute, Malcolm II. John Fordan tells us that he went on a raid into Cumbria perhaps spoiling for a fight, knowing that this would draw Malcolm into a confrontation. According to this theory, it's nothing more than that. With all the forces at their disposal, the Northumbrians crossed into Cumbria at Yetham, which as we know is about here, 
the best known gateway into enemy territory. Rampaged around Cumbria, Strathclyde, could have been anywhere around here, and then encountered Malcolm's army, possibly on their way back, because we know that they were rampaging around Cumbria, Strathclyde. So on their way back, they may, well, this is according to this theory, they may have met Malcolm II, somewhere near the, um, uh, near Linton War Battle. So that's, that's that again. Now, finally, or almost finally, uh, this is why I love this book so much. I, I was amazed to find this. These two passages say more or less the same things. And uh, I'll just read. Few or no items dating from medieval times survive, except for the church and its font. And this is, sorry, the parish of Linton, just to clarify again. Um, but it was recorded that in the course of repairs to the church, a large grave was opened and found to contain 50 skulls, all equally decayed and many with marks of violent blows. It was assumed that they were the remains of Flodden victims. And, and obviously the source for this booklet is, is this, um, uh, again, a 19th century account. And it says, it was written in 1834, and it says, about 50 years ago, during the repairing of the church, a large grave was discovered in which were 50 skulls. All were equally decayed and many of them bore marks of violence. It is conjectured that they belong to individuals who had fallen at Flodden Field, the remains of many of whom, as is well known, were consigned to a common grave in the cemeteries of the nearest border parishes. But what is, um, what's interesting is that the evidence of violent blows may count against the idea that these were Flodden casualties where the damage was largely done by pikemen who aimed at the torso, not the head. Head injuries are likely to be associated more with the kind of warfare encountered in the 11th century. And an equally pertinent question, surely, is why would anyone decapitate the corpses? Isn't one idea that it would be to display them on spikes? 50 would be about the right number. So is it possible that Malcolm repaid Uchtred's Northumbrians in kind for his infamous experience of 12 years earlier? <coughs> the trouble is that uh, this explanation is almost too good to be true. With so many pieces of our jigsaw missing, when a piece is found which appears to fit perfectly, it tends to make one suspicious. But even so, presumably those skulls would have been, re uh, would have been reinterred. If any could be re-excavated and a fragment could be carbon dated, it might just be a smoking gun. So this is my sort of um, rather fantastical idea. Maybe it could be could be demonstrated that, that Linton had something to do with this. This is uh, the names of fields in the area, and it's one of them is the, the this is the place the Trist where the people used to gather before they made raids into Northumbria, and then there's a field there, bare bones. Now that may be a very common, and or in any case, uh, it may be a very common name for a field, and it may have nothing to do with a mage battle. However, it perhaps adds to the picture I'm trying to paint of more battle as a potential battlefield location with at least as much merit as any in the immediate vicinity of Karim itself. And then here is a nice picture of more battle from Wide Open Hill, or, uh, which is again April 2018. And then I spent some time putting this together. <laughs> uh, and then uh, there's also a photograph I took in the, this was um, the previous summer, a Dane, Richard Pedersen, who, who hopes to reopen St. Aidan's Church in your battle. And uh, he runs the coffee shop there on, the, on St. Cuthbert's Way, sort of called St. Cuthbert's Coffee Shop. And finally, St. Cuthbert window in the Kirk at St. Andrew's Wallace Green in Berwick. And the far right, that's a conventional depiction of St. Cuthbert holding the head of St. Oswald uh, at Our Lady in St. Cuthbert's Church in Berwick. I actually spent some time looking for pictures, suitable appropriate pictures of severed heads. And I defy anyone <laughs> to, find, to find a less offensive depiction of a, of a severed head in this one. So, uh, thank you very much. Well, James, thank you very much. That was
quite a, a talk. There's so much information in there. It's quite extraordinary. It's almost like a PhD in, it, in itself. I can't imagine how long it took you to pull that information together. But absolutely fascinating subject. Has anybody got any questions for James? Here's what you put a light on, please. James, you're not going to ask, is there any estimate of the number of people involved in either side? I don't think people have even tried to estimate. I don't think they have. I think I, I've read recently, uh, or I've, I've read that at Hastings, the numbers were quite small. It was about 9,000 on each side. You know, it was a very, very important battle, but only about 9,000 on each side, they think. Um, and uh, and, and um, so, again, the, the numbers of uh, that's just your. That is as good a guess as any, I would say. I mean, but who knows? No, I, I don't think that the historians have even tried to estimate it because there is so much, um, so much that is obscure about this battle. But it was a big scale one. I mean, it was an important one. I think there, there are some historians who think it's less important, but um, but there are also the people who seem to study it more closely are the ones who are who are saying that it is important. But obviously they don't want to sell their books. Yeah. If you ask why the more let more battle about the car, but if Bergen is just across the river from the car, is that not the most obvious in Bergen? Actually, um, there is there is an answer to that. It's uh, Neil Le uh, the, that's where I came across this um, the quote. Uh, Neil McGuigan says that because the I in Virgin it, it's from Bridge, it's not, it, it, is, it, it actually isn't really very close etymologically. That doesn't count. Uh, maybe, but, but, he, but he obviously, uh, no, I mean, he might not be convinced by that, but um, uh, that doesn't count as a particularly close um, etymological connection uh, because, um, because be it, Billet Bergen has an I and it's, and it's based on the bridge. Whereas, but what, specifically, actually, McGuigan talks about a place called Burra in Sands or something. Is there a place in Cumbria? Yeah, and that's where he talked about. And he said that that can't be it for various reasons. But, but he was talking about Cumbria as well because that's the, that's the reference in the, in, in the source. He's, he's talking about Strathclyde and Cumbria. So, but again, having said that, Roxburgh is uh, it's not it, it's it's not certain that it, it is referenced to Roxburgh. I like the idea, but you know, that's not, but it's just it's just an idea. Yeah. So what happened to the skulls that were discovered in Linton? Where are they? Well, they presumably they've been reinterred in the late 18th century when they were when they were discovered. Presumably they've been reinterred, and perhaps they might survive. If they do, as I say, they could be tested. You could send them to um, a radiocarbon accelerator unit that they have in, in Oxford, and they could uh, find out how old they are. Very, very clear. They could get the, get the date very, very close within about 10 years. So, anyway. Any, anyone else? No? Well, thank, I think Mark, I think Mark, I'm right in saying that in the borders, there's only three battlefields on the register, on the inventory of border battlefields. One the Battle of Ancremur, one's the Battle of Darnick, and the other's the Battle of Hoch. I think you'll see that appear on the official register of border battlefields. But we're glad to take one back. We'll take back Linton. If we come to Battle of Linton, it's looking before there. So listen, thank you very, very much for coming to talk to us. Absolutely fascinating.